again, welcome to the Grace Place, and we're delighted you're here. And thank you so much for making it a priority to be in worship this morning. And um, we're going to be looking at um, the third message in, this se- message in this series I started a few weeks ago that's called the Daniel Plan. And it's really basically focusing on God's prescription for health. And uh, we're going to be talking about setting goals in faith. And um, if we're really going to be effective in, um, in moving forward in areas of our lives that need to change, this is extremely important. In fact, a very well-known psychiatrist was asked in his practice, what is the thing that he's done that has been the most helpful um, in helping people to um, really experience lasting change in their life? And he said that without a doubt, the most helpful thing he's ever done is help people to set personal goals to deal with whatever it is. If it's a, you know, if it's a diet-related issue, if it is a financial issue, if it's a marriage issue, whatever it is, that they would set goals. And by doing that, it would enable them to take the steps that were needed to get where they need to go. And um, so I want to take some time today and help us to look at this from several different vantage points. And I'm going to be looking at a lot of different passages of Scripture. So please have your Bible out, and you can follow along at the various places that we will be looking at, because the Bible has an awful lot to say about this issue and how we put it into practice in our lives. And so let me just start by just pointing out the spiritual benefits of setting goals in faith. And I think sometimes people think that, that goal setting and spirituality um, have nothing in common when in reality nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. And this is what it says, that God plans to bring all of history to its goal in Christ. Then Christ will be the head of everything in heaven and on earth. And so goal setting is a spiritual discipline that God wants to bring into our lives. And just like praying and just like reading the Bible and just like um, fasting, you know, goal setting is a spiritual discipline that enables us to be able to um, really make some very important and needed changes in our lives. And so we want to take some time and look at really what God has to say about this, because God says, I want you to understand that I've given you this incredible gift that we call the gift of life. I've given you amazing abilities. I've given you incredible opportunities. I've given you all of these gifts. And what you've got to understand is, and what I've got to understand is, that God expects us to maximize our efforts, and there's no better way to do it than to set the kind of goals that God wants us to set. But see, here's the thing. I have so many times um, talked to people who look at life from, you know, one of three vantage points. And you discover there's a whole group of people who see life as something to waste. And so because of that, they get, you know, do all kinds of things that are destructive to their bodies and all kinds of things that are destructive to their relationships and all kinds of things that are destructive in every capacity um, of the way they live their lives. And then there are other people who look at life as something not to waste, but something to spend. So they just go, you know, pursuing every pleasure, every fun time, every good thing that they can pursue. And so it's really about spending their life. And God says, I want you to see life from the vantage point that he sees it from. And that is that it's an an opportunity to invest our lives in making a difference, you know, in the lives of other people and for the kingdom of God. So I want to take some time to really help us to understand that. Now, someone put it this way, and I shared this with you a while back, but I thought it'd be good to remind us of it. That there are three kinds of people in the world. There are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people who have no idea that anything happened. And then I've got another whole category of people, and um, these are the people that literally drive me absolutely crazy. They don't do anything themselves, but criticize those who are trying to do something with the one and only life they have. And you, live, you get around a person like that, and you know they're not doing anything, 
but they're just absolutely criticizing anyone who tries to do anything with their life. And so, you know, one of the reasons that we need to set goals in our lives is because God is a goal-setting God. Look at what he says. He says, he says, you know, God's plan is to bring all of history to its goal in Christ. Now you say, well, Rick, what in the world does that mean? Well, let me just put it this way. History is not just moving along in a purposeless way because God's ultimate plan for human history is that Jesus Christ will reign and reign supremely over this earth and that every single knee will bow before him, every single tongue will confess, and every single mouth will express that he is Lord of lords and King of kings and surrender to him. And you say, well, Rick, when's that going to happen? Well, I don't have the details as to when it's going to happen, but I do know that's his goal for human history. And see, we've got to keep in mind that if God has goals for, you know, uh, this world and for human history, then he makes it really clear that he wants us to stop and understand that setting goals is a spiritual discipline that is a reflection of God himself in our lives. And some people think, well, I'm not going to plan. I'm just going to trust God. Now, let me just put it this way. That can sound so incredibly spiritual in certain contexts. But that's not spiritual. That's stupid. It's what that really is. You know, because this, what that means is that, you know, that you are going to simply let life pass you by. You're not going to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives to you. And I challenge us all to keep in mind that God is making it very clear that goal setting and having goals in our lives is a spiritual discipline. And then goals focus our energy. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 26 says, I do not run without a goal. I fight like a boxer who is hitting something, not just the air. And so what Paul is saying, he is saying, listen, you know, I don't just go out for a run. I run to basically accomplish a goal. He says, I don't fight like somebody that's boxing air. He said, I fight real opponents. And see, here's the thing we've got to keep in mind is that we must understand that goal setting and having goals in our lives will focus our energies. Say, Rick, what's this got to do with the Daniel plan? Well, if you are looking at an area of your life that you want to change, and it may be that it's something to do with your diet, it may be something to do with your weight, it may have something to do with your marriage, it may have something to do with, um, you know, with your career, it may have something to do in some other area of your life. Wherever it is, it's key to keep in mind that unless you set a goal, you're probably not going to go very far down that road. And so what if, if it's a weight issue, then you set a number goal and make a decision that you're going to pursue that and until you accomplish it. Or if it's something to do with your marriage, you look at it and say, you know, I want to see my marriage improve. Well, then you don't just wish it will improve. You take decided steps towards helping it to improve and get the help that is needed. And um, so goals focus our energy. And I think that far too many times we don't seem to understand that we don't have time for everything. In fact, it feels to me like that a lot of people um, that I talk to are in what I call trivial pursuit. And that's a terrible way for us to live our lives. And so let me just encourage us to realize that the Bible says that we must make, take advantage of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. And so what that means is let's not waste our lives on non-essential things and know the difference between pressures and priorities. Know the difference between activity and achievement and between production and reproduction, between what's urgent and what is truly important we need to know what matters the most. And goal setting will help us to establish what those priorities are and the things that matter the most and focus our energies in that direction. And then goals stretch our faith. Matthew 9, 29. 
according to your faith, will be done unto you. And, um, you know, actually godly goals are a statement of faith. Now, as a church, we've been setting goals for a number of years. In fact, everything that's happened in the last 22 years at the Grace Place had its origin in a planning meeting that our elders and our staff have met together to put together plans for a year or plans for three years or a five-year interval. And, um, you know, those plans, and I remind that group whenever we're working on those plans, those strategic plans that we put together for our church are actually statements and expressions of faith and confidence in God. And, in fact, within a week or so, we'll have the 2016 goals available for you. And I just want to encourage us to keep in mind that goals always stretch our faith. They simply move us beyond where we're at and enable us to experience God doing things that haven't happened before. You know, someone's put it this way. Dreams are good, but dreams don't do anything unless you get up and go to work. And that's exactly what we need to understand about goal setting. And I just challenge us to realize that, you know, resolutions are kind of like dreams that you don't go to work on. And goals are dreams that you get up and go to work on. And when we understand that, it really affects how we deal with our lives. And then goals build our character. Philippians 3, 12, and 14. Do not, I do not claim to have already succeeded or already have become perfect. I keep striving toward the goal for which Christ Jesus has won me to himself. And you know, over and over again, you realize that the plot of movies and the plot of novels and so many of the things that we focus on doing in our lives, you know, we understand that we have to just keep striving towards that goal. And if we're going to achieve it, it means overcoming obstacles, overcoming the challenges, overcoming the disappointments, and the hard places. And that's why goal setting will be something God uses to help us to grow in our character. And see, what is character? Well, you know, reputations, who people think you are. Character is who you are when no one is watching. And so goal setting enables us to really grow in our character because it forces us to deal with who we are on a very personal level and really interact with God in a special way in that context. You know, we're not taking anything with us that we achieve on this earth. You know, you may have a room full of awards and trophies, and I commend you for every one of those. You may have enough diplomas and degrees hanging on your wall that you can make wallpaper out of it, and I commend you for that. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to any of those kinds of things. The other side of it is we have to keep in mind that every single thing we achieve on this planet stays right here. And I've told you this before. I presided over hundreds and hundreds of funerals and memorial services. I've stood by the graveside of many, many people. You know, I've followed the funeral procession. And, you know, when you're a pastor, you're always in the car right behind the hearse. And I can promise you yet, I've yet to see a hearse with a hitch on it. And I certainly never seen one pulling a trailer with a bunch of junk stuffed in it. Because we all understand that everything we achieve on this earth, everything we accumulate on this earth, we leave behind. And that's why it's so important that we have goals that really stretch our character. And so the ways that we develop our character is really setting a goal and not letting the challenges and not letting the obstacles and not letting the difficult places hinder us from achieving that in our lives. In fact, someone put it this way, that life is, that life is a course in character development. And I agree with that 100%. And, you know, this life is all about getting ready for the next life. And so the number one goal in our life has to be that we allow God to work in our circumstances and work through our goals and work through overcoming the challenges to help us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. 
And so God wants us to grow in our character and to better reflect him and help others around us to see Jesus in our lives. How do they see that? Well, they see Jesus in our lives whenever we learn to respond to things the way Jesus did. And if you remember how he responded to trials and how he responded to troubles and how he responded to the difficulties that he went through, it changes then how we deal with it. Look at how he handles criticism. Whenever he was lied about, it said that he didn't utter a word. Now, whenever someone lies about us, slanders us, or does something malicious to us, what do we want to do? We want to retaliate. We want a pound of flesh in return. And so we do, you know, vindictive, retaliatory things. And yet that Jesus says that we demonstrate that we're his children when we handle those kinds of things the way he handled them. And then he wants us to know how to handle our enemies. He wants us to know how to be kind to people who cannot pay us back for our kindness. He wants us to learn to love people the way he loved them, even the unlovely people. And, you know, he was criticized constantly because he hung around with publicans and sinners. That's how it's worded in the New Testament in the King James. And what we've got to keep in mind is over and over again, Jesus demonstrates for us that he understands how to simply live this life in a whole different way. That's why he says that you forgive those who do malicious things to you. In fact, he says that when you forgive, you just keep right on forgiving. And there's a lot of people who say, you know, I can't do that. Well, I'm not telling you it's easy. There's nothing easy about growing in character. But it's incredibly important that we stop and realize that goal setting enables us to grow in our character because it enables us to keep our focus on the most important things and on what God wants us to do with our one and only life. And then goals give us hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, the plans I have for you are plans to prosper you, not to harm you. They're plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. You know, we understand physically this, that you can go for a month or two without food. You can go for a few days without water. You can only go for a few moments without oxygen. And I would put it this way, that you can go for a long ways with a lot of things. But if you don't have hope, then life's going to swamp you very, very quickly. And setting the right kinds of goals will enable us then, no matter what happens, no matter what the obstacles are, no matter what the problems are, to be able to continue to move forward. You know, I don't have to remind you that life is tough. There's nothing easy about it. And the key thing for us to understand that we don't live right now in heaven. We live on a very broken planet called Earth. And life is full of losses. It's full of accidents. It's full of illnesses. It's full of stuff that happens. And I don't know what's going to happen in the next you know, one year or the next five years or the next 10 years of my life, and you don't either. But I do know this, that there will be problems in my life. There will be obstacles. There will be losses. There will be heartbreaks. There will be disappointments. There will be disillusioning circumstances. Now, without hope, what am I going to do? I'm going to give in to despair. I'm going to give in to discouragement. I'm going to be defeated by those things. But setting the right kind of goals in our lives enables us to see beyond those things and realize that God has a future and a hope for us. And so setting the right kinds of goals will enable us to move forward even in the times of loss in our lives. And you know, if we don't have goals for the areas of our lives that need to be dealt with, then we're going to have some major, major problems. You know, so if I was to ask you, what is your goal for your health in the next year? And then if you said I don't have one, then it's going to be that I'm going to be basically like I am or a little bit worse in another 12 months. If I say, well, you know, what's your goal for your finances over the next year? And if you said I don't have one, then I'm going to probably be able to tell you 
that your finances are either going to continue to go south and they're not likely to improve. If I ask you what your goal for your career is, and if you don't have one, then obviously you're going to spend the next year going in a circle. If I ask you what is your goal for your marriage, and you say I don't have one, then I can promise you your marriage is going to be in worse shape a year from now than it is right now. And so let me just encourage us to understand that we need a goal and understand this, that if we aim at nothing, we're going to hit it every single time. That it means we have accomplished nothing, we've achieved nothing, we've gone nowhere. And that's why it's so important for us to set goals. And we need some long-range goals, and then we need some short-range goals that kind of keep us encouraged. Fifteen years ago, this coming May the 1st, I had open-heart surgery. And, you know, I was 46 years old. And um, it was an elective surgery because of some birth defects that I had with my heart. And, um, and so I went into surgery totally healthy. Came out of surgery feeling like they'd run over me with a bulldozer. And that's not really an exaggeration. And, um, and so after I came out of surgery, I had some, some short-term goals that were pretty important. I mean, my very first one was just being able to brush my teeth. And my second one was to be able to get out of the bed to go to the bathroom. And my third one was to be able to get a shower. I'm, you know, one of these guys that can't stand more than a maximum of 12 or 24 hours of Rick, depending on the day. And so, you know, understanding those are some of my little goals and my wife was being very helpful and uh, I had a phenomenal male nurse that helped me with you know getting my shower like about a day and a half or two days after the surgery and um, and then you know my next goal was to be able to just simply walk around the corridor of the hospital and then my biggest goal was to what? Go home, all right? That was my biggest goal. See, whenever you're in a situation like that, and, you know, and as a pretty painful situation, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you're not looking at 10-year goals, all right? You're looking at a goal that's the next thing in front of you, the next obstacle to overcome. And I think that some of us, we need to understand that we need to start with some small goals in our lives. We need to get some little wins under our belt. And brushing your teeth doesn't seem like a big deal until they've had tubes stuffed down your throat and all the kinds of things that they're doing when something like that goes on. You know, that is a big deal whenever you're dealing with that. And so some of us have never set a goal in our life. So let me just encourage you. Start with something that's uncomplicated, something that is, something that is you know, achievable fairly quickly. And understand how important that is. And if you'll do that, it'll get you started. And if you're wanting to do a weight loss goal and you need to lose 50 pounds, don't set a 50-pound goal. Say that in the next two months, I'm going to lose 12 pounds. And make it where it's an achievable goal and something you can do. I just want to challenge us to realize how important understanding some of those things are. Well, what kind of goal will God bless in my life? Well... God, first of all, blesses goals that bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. See, anything that can be done for God's glory is something that we do with the right motivations. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.9 says, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. See, any goal that causes me to become more and more like Jesus Christ brings glory to God. Any goal that creates great gratefulness in my heart to God is a goal that pleases God and brings glory to Him. Any goal that causes me want to, to want to serve Him in a more significant way is a goal that will certainly bring glory to God. And anything that I do that causes other people to brag on Jesus is a goal that truly does bring glory to God. And so God blesses goals that bring glory to God. 
And then God blesses goals that are motivated by love. Um, 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Everything you do must be done with love. See, here's the thing. God's more interested in my heart than he is in my actions. And he's going to bless a goal that is motivated by love. But he's not going to bless a, bless a goal that's motivated by fear. God's not going to bless a goal that's motivated by guilt. He's not going to bless a goal that is motivated by pride, that you just want to be better than someone else. Some people set goals because of peer pressure. Everybody else is doing it, so I will do that. Um, you know, they're kind of all upgrading, so I'll upgrade. Um, some goals are motivated by jealousy and envy. God's not going to bless that kind of goal. Some goals are motivated by materialism. I just want to get more and more and more. And God's not going to bless those kinds of goals. In fact, God's not going to bless goals that are prompted by jealousy or by pride. See, God wants us to love him with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And to learn to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. And so 1 Corinthians 6, 14 that says, Everything you do must be done with love. And I think that it's tragically um, an issue that far too many times we set goals, not because it's motivated by the right things, but it's motivated by the wrong things. And that's why God says, I want you to realize that I want you to set goals that truly are motivated by deep devotion and love to me. And then God, the goals fulfill one of God's purposes for your life. Romans 6.13 says, Do not use any part of yourselves to sin or to be used for wicked purposes. Instead, give yourselves to God. Surrender your whole being to him to be used for righteous purposes. See, God has five purposes for our lives. And if you've ever read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, you know, he highlights those five purposes in that book. And I want to really encourage you to reread that or if you've never read it before, to get it and read, even though it's been out for a while. Because it will help us to really understand how important it is that we live a life that is focused on the right kinds of things. And so God has these purposes for us. And he says, when you're focused on fulfilling my purpose for your life, I will bless you, bless your goals in special ways. And one of the reasons that I think so many of us have such a difficult time in our lives is because we're asking God to bless, you know, whatever it is we want to do rather than focus on identifying what he's blessing and doing that. And, you know, a number of years ago, I began praying this prayer. God, quit helping me or help me to quit asking you to bless what I'm doing and to understand what you're blessing and do it. When we begin to understand that, that changes how we deal with our lives. So when I understand God's purpose for my life, understand what his purposes are, and I start focusing on fulfilling them, God's blessing is going to be automatic. But whenever I'm trying to do whatever it is I want to do, contrary to his purpose, contrary to his plan and purpose for my life, then I'll not experience his blessing on my life. And so that's why it's so important that we focus on understanding God's purposes. When we understand that this life is all about preparation for eternal life. And um, then we're going to view the goals that we set from a very, very different perspective. And so when you pray and when I pray, let me just encourage us to pray. God, help me to align my life with your purposes with your plan for my life. And when we begin to understand that, then it changes every aspect of our lives. And then, you know, Paul was somebody who understood how important it was that we focus like a, you know, laser on our, on God's purposes for our lives. He says, I run straight toward the goal with purpose in every single step. And whenever we are focused on whatever it is that God wants us to do with every single step, it changes everything in our lives. And then godly goals are set in faith. 
If you want God's blessings on your life, you have to set goals that are big enough that it requires faith for God to do it. And um, if you set small goals that you can do in your own power, don't call that a goal. That's a to-do list is what it really is. But a goal that will simply bless and honor God is a goal that is so big and so awesome that it cannot be accomplished unless God does something very special. And I don't know what kind of big goals you have in your life. And I don't know what kind of goals you've set. You know, one of the things I have are some life goals, some things that I want to do um, as a part of what God wants me to do with my life. And one of the goals that I've set is that, you know, I want to get to a place where I can return to God 40% of all of my income. And you say, Rick, that's a crazy goal. Well, it's a crazy goal if you aren't setting it and taking steps to get there. But whenever you get to a point that I look at it and realize that that's a very achievable goal, all it takes is just a couple of additional financial decisions that, that we're in the process of doing. And I believe we can get to the point where you do that. So well, why do you want to do that? Well, a bunch of reasons. One is uh, I happen to believe that the only thing in this world that I can take with me is what I send ahead. And remember what Jesus said, that if you give so much as a cup of cold water in my name, then there's going to be an eternal reward for it. And as I shared a few minutes ago, I have followed many hearses to the cemetery. Not a single one I have ever followed has had a hitch on the back of it. And that's important to keep in mind and understand that everything that I accumulate in this world, I leave behind. Everything I send on before has the potential of eternal rewards associated with it. And so I'd like to have the maximum number of eternal rewards since I'm only going to live for a few years in this life. And where I'm at right now, I realize I've lived a lot more in the past than I'll live in the future. It only makes sense to me that I want the remaining years of my life to be focused on making sure that every single thing that I can do that's focused on the kingdom of God and has eternal dividends, it only makes sense. Because I'm probably going to enjoy whatever's in this world anywhere from a few days to a decade or two. And then somebody else has it. But I can promise you that whenever God enables us to get to that place to do it, which I think will happen in the next year or so, whenever we get to that place, then there are eternal dividends that I'll be reaping the benefits of for how long? Not a dozen years or so, but forever and ever. And I just want to challenge us today. You said, you don't need to do what I'm doing. I'm not saying that. Did he even try to influence you to do it? That's something I just feel like God's spoken to me about as being extremely important in my own personal life. And it's a part of the disciplines that I believe God wants me to continue to develop. Um, and he's been working on this area of my life for many, many years. And so I just want to challenge us to understand how important it is that we need to set some God-sized goals and understand that when we do that, then God does God-sized things in our lives. And then godly goals are achieved with God's power. You know, the kind of goals that God blesses are so big that God has to step in and help us and to give us the strength that we need to be able to accomplish it. Now, I looked up on the Internet on Amazon, um, self-help books. And when I typed in, you know, self-help books, do you have any idea how many books are on Amazon alone that are defined as self-help books. You think there's a hundred? You think there's a thousand? You think there's more than a thousand? Do you think there's more than 10,000? How about this? 751,791 on Amazon alone. Do you hear what I said? Three quarters of a million books on self-help. Now, there's a lot of good things in those books, but let me just tell you a little secret. This book right here has more insights into self-help than any book you're going to buy on Amazon. 
Now, I'm not telling you, I think some of us would benefit from a good time management book. I think some of us would benefit from a good goal setting book that helps us to really understand how to set good goals and to implement them and go forward. So I'm not devaluing that at all. You know, maybe one of these days I'll write one and there'll be a, another one on Amazon. How about that? Here's the deal. You know, I just want to encourage us, keep in mind, that God makes it really, really clear that he wants us to take the steps forward. But the good news is this, that if we'll do that, then he gives us the strength and the power to do it. And that's what we must keep in mind, that God's so clear that he doesn't ask us to do something. You know, so you say, well, Rick, where does the power not to worry come from? Well, it doesn't come from reading some self-help book. The power to not worry whenever you're facing huge challenges comes only from doing what, you know, Philippians 4, 6 says. Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and petitions, make your requests known to God. And then the peace of God that's not connected to circumstances will flood your mind and your heart and your soul. And so it's important to keep in mind that the power not to worry comes from God and the power to be patient comes from God and the power to love unlovely people comes from God and the power to do the right thing, the honest thing and the ethical thing when everybody else is cheating comes only from God. And let me tell you what, God just challenges us to just get started in putting together some plans that he can help us to focus on implementing in our lives and I want to challenge us to get involved in understanding that in the Daniel plan materials is some good information to help you with setting some goals and I want to really encourage you if you've not gotten that information yet go to our bookstore pick it up and start putting it into practice in the areas of your life where you need God to help you experience his power and transformation in a special way because if you don't then this whole year is going to go by there's not going to be any change that happens in your life your circumstances I promise you are not going to stay static they always get a little more challenging and a little more complicated and a little more difficult whenever we begin to understand how essential it is that we just simply let God work in this very important area of setting goals in faith, we'll see God at work lives like we've never seen him at work before. Let me pray with you. God, we come to you right now very aware that your Holy Spirit is speaking to many of us about taking some steps we haven't taken before. And that is really turning these things over to you in our lives. And so I pray today that you would just help each of us at this moment to be very aware that you call us to surrender our goals to you and allow you to work through them where you're going to be honored and glorified and that we're going to experience permanent and lasting change because of that. And so we surrender all these things to a God who's more than able to do in our lives what needs to be done. And God, I know that if we'll just take a hold of what we've been talking about, that every single one of us in this room We'll see you working in the areas of our lives like we've never seen you work before, doing things like we've never seen you do before, and accomplishing things for your kingdom's sake that have not been accomplished before. So we praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings, and we pray your strength be given to all of us. And then, God, I just pray for those who are here who do not know you as their Savior, that at this moment they would say, Jesus, Thank you for dying as my substitute on the cross. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I know that when you died on the cross, you took the punishment I deserve upon yourself. And I receive from you the free gift of spiritual transformation and the free gift of eternal and everlasting life. So God, I thank you that you are now doing a spiritual miracle in the lives of those who prayed that prayer and who invite you to take control of their lives. And I know because of the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection, that if we truly pray that prayer and mean it, that we'll spend forever with you eternally. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.